glad you're here. Another day with the Lord. And with us caring. It's going to be good. Um, if you're new here, welcome. And uh, you're part of our family. time together. And Lord, Lord, we thank you that we belong to you. And Lord, we appreciate you so much that we uh, have a place to worship and to gather together and to be a family. And, and Lord, we're just so glad we're in there. Lord, bless this time together. Uh, bless our speakers. And Lord, just uh, bless us today. Amen. Amen. Lord, may the word be come right up. Just like a child, remember us, Lord, remember us. 
because we need that grace this morning. I mean, let's sing that, that first verse one more time. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God.
not for our entertainment, you realize that. And I think about this as a, a parent. You remember telling your child, now say thank you. Whether you mean it or not. <laughs> but you're going to do it, right? Yes. And it's, it's interesting how a lot of times as you're older, you realize, boy, there's times you said thank you, and it was, it was just from your heart. And you said thank you. This is that, as we're just in that spot where we say, hey, don't forget to say thank you. Don't forget that gratitude. Don't forget to, to recognize that what he's done. So we sing this song this morning. It's uh, a prayer. And this this song is uh, a song that I, I don't sing a lot because it is uh, powerful. It's one of those ones that... Uh, you could, you, when you finish singing it, someone could come in here and, and they could say, did you hear what you just said? Did you, did you really realize what you just said as a prayer? And that is, take my life, Lord. Take my life, all my life. Whew, that's a big prayer, isn't it? It's one we want to take seriously. I had a, a pastor friend of mine and we were talking and there was a special person in my life I've been praying for and he said are you willing to pray Lord whatever it takes because he said that's a big prayer but he's a big God and as we pray this morning as we pray this song are you willing to let that be your prayer and say Lord whatever it takes not my will Lord but yours and I want you to do that's our heart today. This is the time when you're in that secret place, even though we're together, it's between you and him as we sing this morning. Just let it be our prayer.
after we sing that, I'm going to ask Geraldine to come and share just a little testimony with you. <clears throat> when I talked with her, I couldn't help this song just was in my head. Just to say, take my life. Whatever it be, just take my life. And again, when we sing brokenness, that doesn't sound like a very fun verse, does it? But he says, that's what you need. It's less of you and more of me. And will you just trust me? Trust me, no matter what, that you need less of you and more of me. So let's sit down. So he took me home, 
and during nine days of my ordeal, I could not keep anything in me, not one thing. And he was so scared, I lost almost 12 pounds. And I was so frail on the ninth day, but during those nine days, he brought me back to the moment I accepted the Lord. I remember sitting in the, out there and Pastor Cummings asked for an altar call. And all of a sudden, I felt this pushing. And who is pushing me? And there was nobody there. And then it pushed me again. And I looked, and there was nobody there. The third time, I said, okay, I'm going. So I went up there, and I just saw. And he laid his hands on me, and he prayed. And I asked the Lord to come to my life. I was 17 years old. I was 35 years ago. And he brought me from there and all the time. And the moment I asked the Lord to come into my life, I asked one prayer. Please, Lord, break my will. Because my will was so strong. And I said, if you can break my will, I am yours. And for 35 years, he's been chipping and chipping and chipping and chipping and chipping away. Because I've been praying and praying, Lord, please break my will. And that ninth day, he broke me into pieces. Because I was ready to die. And he picked me up like this. And he says, get up. Get up and eat right now. Eat. And I'm like, Lord, I can't eat. Get up and eat. And all of a sudden, the pushing happened. Pushing it. And I remember that pushing. And I called my niece. I said, Call your deal and tell him to bring me a sandwich. <laughs> right now, bring me a sandwich. Chick fil A, I don't care. <laughs> so we went to Chick fil A. He just got done doing the job. He went to Chick fil A. It was the first day he left me because he had to do this job. It was March 14th, and he came home, and he's and they're like, I don't know how she's gonna eat. She, I can't get, she can't keep anything down. And I took that sandwich and I ate a quarter of it, and it stayed. And then a couple hours later, he says, Eat some more. And I took that sandwich and I ate another quarter. And then a couple hours later, and it just kept going and going and going. Until my strength came back. God took me to break death, to break my will. And he put me into pieces, in his holy pieces. And I rededicated my life that day. And I said, Lord, I'm no longer going to be afraid to be bold, to tell my testimony. Because it happened. It happened. And God saved me. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, God is alive. Amen. And he loves us. Amen. Even in the break of death, he is there with us. Amen. So Pastor coming, and the Pastor Rock comes and visits me. I almost missed him. I was in the shower. <laughs> and he comes and I told him my testimony, and he shared his testimony, and we were both ready because we were both willing to do his will. And this song is a powerful song, and it's a true song because God loves me.
And I use it daily, constantly. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, today is my first birthday of my own life. <laughs> Geraldine's birthday today. She, she, she said 35 years ago. That yeah, can't be right. And then she gave her heart to the Lord. Because she's so young now. Uh, but it was encouraging to me. I just really wanted you to be able to hear that for yourselves. You know, you've been praying for her. She had so much energy and, and, and recovery. She made me a special meal for, for my recovery. And I was just like, wow, look at that. What God's doing. But when we when we pray that prayer, it's a powerful prayer. <coughs> Say, Lord, I you know what it really is, it's a prayer of faith. Saying, Lord, I trust you. That you have you have what I need. It's not about me. Let's sing this chorus before we pray. It says this I surrender all. Thank you. 
that you've give, given her life, Lord, again. Lord, we pray right now for her family. Lord, we pray that they would just be blessed because of this. Lord, we pray that they would know you, Lord Jesus. That they would know that you are God, that you are the healer, Lord, that you are the one who, who has our lives in your hands. Lord, we pray right now that you would just touch her body, Lord, in a way only you can do. Lord, we pray that you would just give her the healing that you have for her, Lord. We pray that you would just restore to her life. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for others who are going through physical needs today, Lord, that you are the healer, Lord, that you are in control of those things, Lord, that you have our bodies in your, in your hands, Lord, that you're able to, to heal us completely. Father, we pray for Carl this week as he goes through a procedure. We just ask your presence on him, Lord. We ask your, your spirit, Lord, that you would just bless him, Lord, at this time. Lord, we pray for the miracle, Lord, that you bring, Lord, in, in life and in healing. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for being with us, Lord, and meeting our every need, Lord. And we just pray that you would help us to see that. Father, as we look at our our world and things that are so far beyond us, Lord, things that seem overwhelming to us and we wonder what we can do. We can say this, your grace is enough. Lord, that your, your kingdom is enough. Lord, that you are the, on the throne and we pray, Lord, that you would just meet needs around the world, Lord, even people that we don't know, people that we don't see, Lord, that you, that you have a heart for them. And Lord, because of that, that you would give us your heart. Lord, we pray that you would help us to care about people we've never even met, Lord, because you care. Lord, we ask that you would just let your message be known. We ask that hope would be known. Lord, that your love would be made known. The power of the cross would be made known, Jesus, in our world. We thank you for it. Lord, continue to just guide our hearts this morning and lead us in the way only you can do. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to be listeners and to be listening for you, Jesus, that you would have our lives, and we ask it in your name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you this morning. You may be seated. It's good to be a listener, isn't it? Amen. It's even better to be a listener that responds to what God is saying, and so we want to do that today. I want to share some announcements with you, and uh, I don't like to spend a lot of time on announcements normally, but uh, there's some important things here, and I wanted to share those with you. One is we uh, we do have our, our Bible study. Uh, we have a ladies' Bible study tomorrow night, Monday at 6.30. It's downstairs here. Uh, our men's Bible study will be resuming again, and we'll be up in the chapel uh, up there uh, around the corner. Uh, so we're excited about that. We have a Tuesday Bible study for the daytime that meets here at 2.30. Uh, 2.30. At, I don't know what's at 2.30. At 9.30, though, the ladies will be down here, and then that's a different ladies' study. And so we invite you to, to check that out and be a part of that. Um, and one of the reasons those are important announcements is, is because it's just a tool to help you to be a self-feeder that you need to be growing, that you want to be deeper in your relationship. And it's not that you know more Bible so that you're better at trivia or that you're smarter than someone else. It's so that you know Jesus. Amen. 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 And so if that's your goal, we just want to put some, some things out for you. Last week, we had a gentleman here and, and his wife, and they were here, and, and she shared and reading or memorizing God's Word. And so if you were here and you were part of that, and maybe you took uh, note of his challenge for you to memorize some scripture, I wanted to just kind of team up with him on that and kind of help you out a little bit. So if you did it, um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But so try to make no face. If you're the one that you said, yes, I wanted to do that. He said three months to... he. That's a, that's a generous amount of time. But you know what? It's easy to get lost in that amount of time, isn't it? Yeah. And so, again, I can't do it for you. No one can do it for you. But we can encourage each other and help each other. And so what I'd like to do is, if you are one of the ones that wanted to memorize like that, one of the things he said was for the first 30 days to read that passage of Scripture out loud. So if you were going to do a chapter, you'd read that chapter out loud. <laughs> 30 days. Do you know what? Sometimes that takes a lot of time. 
and you're not going to but it's a commitment that you've decided to make. And if you are wanting to do that, and you're wanting to do that uh, three months challenge, um, there's a, I, I just made a little sheet in the back. If you would like a reminder every day, just a little email or a little text, then you sign up and you say what you're doing. And you, if you don't want to do that, you can do it on your own, that's fine. But if, you, if that would be helpful to you, then you do that and we'll just get in touch with you every day and say, hey, did you read it? Did you do it? Did you, were you able to do that? And then in three months, and so you know what? It's almost April, so I thought, well, maybe you started already. That's great. Maybe you thought about starting, but you didn't yet. April's a great month to start, isn't it? And you'd have three months, and by the end of June, you'd have this whole chapter, or maybe a whole book of the Bible memorized. Do you think that's worth it? It, I think it's so, so anyway we just want to make that tool available for you uh, there's some other things that we're going to try to continue to help you and just in your growth that if you want to do it then it's there for you and we just want to encourage you because it's it's not about what happened it's not about just us and just it's about saying Lord we want to know you more and believe when you put God's word in your heart it'll make a difference so also, just wanted to let you know some upcoming things. In April, there's going to be a Good Friday service for the community, and, and we're going to uh, just invite everyone to be a part of that. It's at 6 p.m. at Auburn Grace, and it's going to be in the multiple churches. So I just wanted to kind of put that on your radar. Um, also, coming up uh, in the next little bit, we're going to try to put some more, again, tools out there for you, uh, possibly a Bible study that's uh, we call I call it soap Bible study. It's just where you're looking at scripture, you're seeing what you see, and then at the very end, we would just maybe share what God laid on our hearts. But it's it's not a, a big discussion time. It's more of a, just a, a private time together. And so we're going to be doing some of those things. Uh, this morning, I was excited to have uh, uh, Jose and Ashley with us. And uh, we've kind of, we, we got to have them earlier before they left the field and it's been a while and then we've been kind of crossing back and forth and and I made it really hard and then uh, Michelle touched base with them and uh, it was great to have them come but they're going to just come and share a little bit of what God's been doing in their ministry and what's ahead and just a little bit of encouragement for us this morning and so I'm just going to ask them to come and share their heart and their message for missions Good morning. It's always a blessing to be in the house of God, isn't it? Amen. It's always a joy to be able to worship His name together as the body of Christ. Man, one thing we do, we, jo we rejoice in is being missionaries. We go to churches and have the church and visit different places. And one of the things we know, like the same God that dwells in here, the same God that's working on, down in Grass Valley over there, and the same God that's working over there in Rockland. And it's amazing to see God touching people's lives, bringing healing, bringing restoration, and doing a miraculous miracle on people. I just want to rejoice with you this morning and what God's been doing in this church and how God's been working in Pastor Rob's life and Sister's life back in the back there and how God's moving in this place. I mean, because no, we serve a God who wants to do some great things in your life. Amen. If we come with the heart of expectation, God's going to do something amazing. But if you come with the heart of uh, disappointment and, and, and rejection, He's never, He really can't move in that environment. But if you come here saying, God, I want something from you, God's going to move and He's going to do something you can, He can only do in you. And through you. So this morning we're, we're going to preach to you, we're going to teach to you, talk to you about missions, but really our goal at the end of the day is for you to hear God. Amen. And for you to drop closer to Him for what you need this place. And so if we can, one more time, just pray and just have God and continue to have His way in this environment and in this place. Father God, we just come to you, Lord, and we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for you who are here today, Father. You are with your people, God. And you have a great blessing in store for us today, God. Father, I pray that you continue to move upon each person here today, Father. And we pray that you just move in a real refreshing way, God. That you continue to draw us closer to you, Father. And break the barriers, the walls, the obstacles that we may have in our lives that prevents us from pressing in forward, God. May you break those walls down now in the name of Jesus. And may you help us to draw closer to your presence. Lead us today, Father. And may you have your way in us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, my name is Jose. This is my beautiful wife, Ashley. And we are missionaries to the country of Spain. 
We've been working there the last three and a half years, uh, ministering in the city called Granada, helping to establish various different things. But I asked him to talk about that in a little bit. We have three more members of our team who are with us this morning. They're with my brother down in Watsonville, my brother's pastor in the Watsonville area. And they decided to stay with them. We have a, if we can go with the kids, we have a 10 year old, Isaac Daniel. We have an 8 year old, Olivia. And we have a 5 year old, uh, Alicia. Alicia is a little Spanish girl. She was three months old when we landed in Spain. So the first three and a half years of her life, all she knew was Spain. The only thing she knew about the United States was what we told her, what she saw on TV, or through face FaceTime. And how she would talk to her grandpa, grandma, mama, and papa. And so when we landed back in the United States, I went to Alicia and said, Alicia, we're going to go to Walmart and pick up some supplies. Do you want to go with me to Walmart? She looks at me and says, Daddy, what's a Walmart? <laughs> so for the first time in her life, she got to discover what Walmart was, what Target is, what Costco is, what all the big boxes places are. And uh, we're telling her we're getting ready to leave again. She looks at me and says, Dad, is there a Walmart and Co Target in, in, in Spain? And we say, no, I'm sorry, babe. There's no Walmart or, or, or Target in Spain. That's a sacrifice you need to have, baby. You need to give us up. <laughs> but she's excited about going to Spain. She's excited about what God's going to do there. Our three kids pray with them. Uh, it's not going to be easy for us to transition back. We've been here two years already stateside. Huh? Almost two years stateside. And uh, it's going to be a little difficult to transition. And so just pray with them. Pray that God blesses us as we get ready to gear up to go May or June, pray for them, hopefully, and to get ourselves back on the field. Pray that God continue to use them in the field. They've been a blessing to us on the field. Uh, they've been a part of our ministry since day one when we landed in Spain. And they've helped to open doors of opportunity for us to minister to people, families, because of them. I'm going to ask you to share some of the ministry you did in Spain. Good morning. It's so good to be here with you all today. It's, it's, we are so appreciative. I know so many of you have been praying for us along our journey, and, and we are so thankful. We cannot do what we do without the prayers of the, our fellow believers uh, that are here at, at, at home, and uh, we're so thankful. We appreciate it beyond what words can say. And uh, we, uh, this last three and a half years, uh, well, we were in Granada, like you mentioned, it's a, in the southern part of Spain, and we were part of our church planting team there. And we have some uh, pictures that you can kind of a collage that of uh, some of the things that we were doing. Uh, when we got there, there was there was a um, a missionary there that had established a university ministry, and when we got there, we start help them start a church. Uh, we kind of were part. They had just started right before we got there. They're just, um, doing a church plant, so we got to be part of a church planting team and a, a bilingual community of faith there in Granada. And but they had been focusing mostly on university, so we came alongside and started a family outreach ministry, reaching out to children and parents and grandparents. And so one of our big things we did was the story time, where we had a story in English. Uh, one Saturday a month where we would invite uh, families to come and have a story in English, like I said, in songs and games and crafts and activities. And, and we would have an opportunity to build relationships with people. Only around 1% of Spanish people are born again of believers. And the vast majority um, do not have an understanding of who Jesus really is. They Yes, they heard his name. I kind of... I make this corny joke that they probably have a friend named Jesus. They've heard the name Jesus, but they do not know um, Jesus Christ as risen Lord and Savior of their lives. They've seen um, that man named Jesus on a cross in a pretty church, but they do not realize that he is so much more than that, but that there is hope and freedom in having a personal relationship with him. And so most of them do not even know somebody who's actually following Christ because there's so few uh, believers in Spain that they don't even know somebody that is a true follower of Jesus that knows him, has a relationship with him. So that's part of what we do. We build relationships with people. As people who have relationships with Jesus, we build relationships with people who um, have not yet come to that understanding of who he can be in their lives. And through those relationships, uh, we can share our story, share our testimony, share the truth of who Jesus is, and that there is hope in him. There is peace in him. There is a lot of um, lack of peace in Spain. They, they are looking for something. They've looked in different directions. They've kind of gone to the, the Eastern religions and Buddhism. And we had one friend that said, you know, Jesus, like, Spanish girl, very intelligent, spoke multiple languages. But she's like, Jesus and Buddha are basically the same, right? They're both born in palaces. You know, just like 
they don't have the just the truth of the gospel, the truth of what God's word says. They just are, it's just lost on them. And a lot of times they think an evangelical church is a cult. So generally, they're not interested in coming and checking out a church without having that relationship established. And we just generally, we don't get to just invite them first thing before we get to know them to our church service because they are like, uh, if it's Christian but not Catholic, it must be something weird. It's, to, it's kind of their mindset. And so... Obviously, we're not a fault, so we build those relationships with people, we build that community, and we have the opportunity to share that, show that Jesus is so much more than what they've had in their mind of him, and that we're not just these foreign weirdos, but that was some strange religion, but that we are people who love Jesus and love them, and want to share life with them, and want to make, um, what have, want them to experience Jesus for who he really is and what he can do in their lives. So this uh, next term, we actually are transitioning to a new city. Uh, it is a bigger city, it, and the city of Malaga is a bigger city, around 650,000 people, and has very little gospel witness. So we are going to be going with a team there to plant an international church. There are a lot of expats, people that have come from other countries there to work, and a lot of immigrants. It's actually um, along the southern coast, so a lot of people from Africa are coming in through, coming into Europe through this city. And so, obviously, we want to reach out to the many Spanish people who are yet to understand the truth of Jesus, but also these other um, people groups that are there as well. We want to share the truth and hope of Jesus in this city of Malaga. So, like I said, we're going to plant an international church, but alongside that, God has given us vision to um, do a cultural coffee house because it's going to be called El Puente, which means the bridge, because we want to bridge people first and foremost to Jesus Christ but also to the body of Christ. We understand how crucial it is. You know, We want people to know Jesus, but they need to be a part, become a part of that body of Christ where they can be discipled, where they can grow, and that they can be sent out so that the gospel can go beyond us, so they can reach others, and that there can be a multiplication effect for the kingdom of God. And so we have this idea, this avenue in mind, because, like I said, most people aren't going to come and just check out the church to begin with. But if we have a venue where we can have those opportunities to build relationships with them and get those things established and then bridge them as well to the church and that we believe Jesus can do powerful things. We know that it's not about what we alone can do or what, what ideas we can have, but through the Holy Spirit's power at work within us, we can see um, mighty things done for the Lord and his kingdom. So thank you all for your part in that. Amen. And we're excited about this new work God put in our hearts to do. We're excited about being part of this new team. I mean, this team is from all over the United States. We have a, a couple from Wisconsin, a couple from uh, Michigan, a couple from Alabama, a couple from us from California, all put together working in a country called Spain and Malaga. Only God can put that together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're excited about being part of this team to see God unfold in this country. But pray with us. Pray for the, for the, the six, 650,000 people that, that, that they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for us as we connect with city officials to connect with establishing building business licenses and getting the facilities established for a church and getting things off the ground that we may connect with the right people. That God may give us favor wherever we go. People may look at this country, this city of 650,000 people with little to no evangelical presence think, how are you going to do it? One thing we make sure we stand ourselves on is the foundation of Jesus Christ. We can't do it. If I go on my own power, my own strength, I'm not going to be able to do it. But our goal and our prayer is always this. God, may your will be done. May your purpose unfold. May your plan be coming to the, for to the forefront lines. Because if it's your plan, God, and it's his purpose and his goal, then even when God calls us home, he'll stand the test of time. Because it's not based on us, but it's based on him. So help and pray for us that we continue to keep that as the, the focal point of what we're doing in ministry. We're just trying to fulfill his will and his purpose in our lives. So we thank you again for the opportunity to come and share um, a little bit about what God's doing with us in Spain, but as well as the word. About uh, when we were getting ready to come back from, from Spain, we were in our prayer closet, just praying, saying, God, give us a word to encourage the church back home. And during that same season, I was doing a book study on the Gospel of Mark. I really love reading the Gospels. You know, who loves spending time reading the life of Jesus, of Jesus Christ? I love it. I love reading the Gospel message. I love how looking at Jesus and how Jesus never saw someone as an interruption to his ministry, but saw everyone in his opportunities to share what God was all about. No one was having an interruption to Jesus. Think about it. When the Sadducees and the Pharisees were sitting amongst Jesus in, in, the, in the crowd with Jesus asking him questions, 
to try to discredit him. Jesus could have got angry, he could have got upset, he could have rebuked them and said, get out of here. But instead he responded to their questions and answered them and showed to them really what the heart of God was all about. When the, when the blind man on the side of the road was yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody told him to be quiet. Sit down, leave the rabbi alone. He's going somewhere special. You don't have it right now. But when Jesus heard that proclamation, Jesus and the David have mercy on me, Jesus stops. He walks over to this man and heals him of his sickness. See, Jesus never saw someone as an interruption to his ministry, but saw everyone as an opportunity. When the woman who was hemorrhaging, there was Jesus hemorrhaging, Jesus who touched Jesus' garment, Jesus could have kept on walking. He was on the way to Jairus' house, remember? He was going to go heal Jairus' daughter of being sick. He was on his way somewhere. He could have just kept on walking because the woman was healed. She was done with. But instead, Jesus stops, turns around, asks the crowd who touched me, and everybody is looking at him like everybody's touching you, but knowing that someone touched him who had faith in what God can do. And he turns around, he loves on her, and he not only restores her physically, but restores her to community, restores her to life. Jesus never saw someone as interruption to ministry, but everyone was an opportunity. Now, what that, what that tells me today as a Christian, no one in my life should ever be an interruption, even the most annoying person. How many of you know annoying people? How many of you are sitting next to him right now? No, just kidding. No, just kidding. We all know annoying people. People that frustrate us. If you're a ministry and you're a pastor or a ministry, you know those people who you teach, you train, you disciple. And they continue to follow with the same thing over and over and over again. And then you look at yourself and think, my goodness, when are you going to get it? But as long as, there's, as long as there's breath in their lungs, there's still hope for them to be redeemed by the God that we love. Amen. So we should never give up. We continue to press on. Continue to press forward. To know that as long as there's breath in their lungs, God has a purpose and plan for their lives. No one is outside the spectrum to be redeemed by God. As long as we're willing to stand before them and present the gospel to them. There was one man that really spoke to, to us. He's found in the book of Mark, chapter 5. He's not part of Jesus' culture. He's not part of Jesus' community. He's a man who's, who's, who's living on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A man, most likely, who was a Gentile or far away from anything to do with the Jew, Jewish tradition because he was, he was a man that lived in a region where there was pigs. He was a man that, but who lost his way, lost his humanity, lost his identity, lost himself, and was living in a state of chaos. A man that we don't know, we don't get a background of who he is or how he got to this point, but we just know him by what he was dealing with the legions. Many of us may know this story. And I'm going to, just for the time's sake, we're not going to read the text. I'm just going to go through and simply just give a little explanation of what the story talks about. Jesus was on the other side of Galilee doing ministry. He tells the disciples, let's get ready, let's get on the boat. Jesus gets on the boat and sets sail to the other side of the sea of Galilee. And Jesus lands on the, lands on the sea on the shore, this man, who was demonic possessed, runs down towards Jesus, throws himself at the feet of Jesus. And, and, and this, this whole transaction occurs between Jesus and this man. And what did Jesus do? He heals him, redeems him, and sets him free from the captive state that he was in. What I love about looking at the story is this, is that Jesus, when an encounter with Jesus, when we have an encounter with Jesus, it changes the trajectory of our lives. It changes who we are. It changes our identity. It changes our perspective. It changes our personality. It changes us who we are because of the encounter we have with Christ. So when this man had an encounter with Jesus, it changed him for the better. Scripture never tells us a background how this man got to the situation. But knowing we're intelligent people and we can read through Scripture and kind of make some you know, educational guesses of some of the things that most likely brought him down a path to separate him first and foremost from God then separated from his family, then separated from his friends, then separated from his community, then separated from his humanity. That the only place he could find himself dwelling was a place of hopelessness, in the tombs. Is there any hope in tombs? No. Tombs is where death dwells. <clears throat> and this man found himself in a place of hopelessness. He found himself lost. He found himself in decay, in a place of a desperation, a place of a separation between him and God. But yet, God still had a purpose and plan for his life. Why? Because he was still alive. He was still alive. God had a purpose for him in life. Remember, when, if we read through Genesis, when beginning of time when Jesus, God created the heavens and the earth, God spoke everything into existence. I love about traveling as missionaries. Ashley's from West Virginia. I'm from California. And we travel all over the place. West Virginia is Green Mountains. 
That one, you know, she's my that one mom. You read John Denver, you know that she's a, she's a country road girl. I'm from West Virginia, you know, California. We got brown hills all over the place. But we have the ocean. She don't got the ocean. But what I love about traveling is we get to see the beauty of nature. Be nature is beautiful. I love seeing the mountains as we are out here, going down to the lake and seeing the lake. All that is beautiful. But when God created that, he just spoke that into existence. He said, let there be trees, and trees showed up. He said, let there be light, and light showed up. Let there be land, and land separate the waters. He said, and he just spoke it, and he came. But when God created man, he took a different approach. He said, let there be man, and all of a sudden man showed up. What he did is he molded us and designed us to a reflection of his image. Not only he molded his eyes to reflect his image, he breathed his spirit in us. He gifted us with his spirit in us. That means that everyone in this world, no matter who they are, no matter how far they are from God, are stamped in the image of God. It's our goal as Christians to go out there and remind you of who the Creator is and how much he loves them. See, this man was stamped in the image of God, but everything and everyone gave up on him. He was living amongst the tombs. He was living amongst the tombs, lost and for, forsaken by all in his community and his life. But when God encountered him, he had encounter with Jesus and restored him, not only to, to his community, but restored him to life. It restored him to his humanity. It restored him to his God. Think about the time you had an encounter with Jesus. Think about your moment of encountering Christ that changed the trajectory of your life. Many of us were probably on the path like this man that was leading them down a separation from God, family, friends, and everything we knew. But when you had an encounter with Jesus, it changed you. It restored you, renewed you to what God created you to be in perfect relationship with you. See, this man lost his way, but God brought him back to life. And what I love about this story is you continue reading that all of a sudden the, the, the pigs go out and they drown in the water because the demons get into them and they drown in the water. And all this stuff unfolds in front of these men they call the herdsmen that were sitting down on the hill. Seeing this all unfold. The herdsmen run towards town, it says in scripture, to tell the townspeople what just happened. And when the townspeople come back from, from the town, they see a man, in Scripture 519, they see a man who's sitting there, clothed, 515, they see a man sitting there clothed in his right mind. And when I could read this portion of Scripture, I always ask myself, man, I understand where the guy got his right mind from, but where did the clothes come from? The clothes had to come from somewhere. The clothes had to come from somewhere. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if Jesus sent his disciples to town, but I, this is what I imagine unfolded when I was reading this text. Here's this man who's just been set free, just been redeemed, just been kept, and just been brought back to life. Sitting on the knees of Jesus. And Jesus is probably crying with joy because of the freedom he received. And I can imagine Jesus looking at this man with love and compassion. Taking him, reaching out his hand and walking him over to the water lake that was not too far away. I can imagine Jesus, he walks him over to the way. Jesus is just loving on him and encouraging him, saying, God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. God loves you. God wants to work in you. And as he walks him over to the lake, while taking him into the lake and washing him of that filth and dirt that's still in his body. Because scripture said he would cut himself with stones. So he most likely he had blood-stained arms. He would live naked amongst the tombs. He was filthy and dirty. And so I can imagine Jesus cleaning him of all that filth and all that groan and all that dirtiness that was on his body. And as he's cleaning it with Jesus calling out with his disciples, saying, Disciples, do we have any clothes on our boat? Or Jesus and the disciples themselves taking off a portion of their garment and giving it to this man. This is what I believe unfolded within this time. Scripture doesn't tell us this what this unfolded, but reading throughout the text and reading the life of Jesus of Jesus Christ, one thing we can know for sure is that Jesus mandates and tells us, he commissions us to do the same thing, doesn't he? He tells us to go out and make disciples. I believe what happened between the time between the herdsmen getting there and the townspeople getting there was called discipleship. Jesus took the opportunity he had with this man to disciple this man and to show him how much God loved him. That's what Jesus did through Scripture. He never, never lost an opportunity to really show people how much God loved them and how much God wanted to work in them. And I believe this is what Jesus did with this man. He discipled him. He showed him how much God loves him and how much God worked with him. This is what God calls us to do. Go out and make disciples. Discipleship is more than just a proclamation behind a pulpit. This is a process of discipleship. But discipleship is more than that. Discipleship is taking somebody along the journey of discovering who God can be in their lives. Helping them to discover the, the things that may make them stumble and fall, the temptations that they that will hold them back, and restoring them into a right relationship with God. Helping them to understand who God can be in them. That's discipleship. 
That's what Jesus, I believe, Jesus did with this man. Because when the townspeople get there, it says in Scripture, when the townspeople get there, they see a man clothed in their right mind. And all of a sudden, these people get afraid. They get afraid. They get frightened what they see unfold before them. And they get afraid. And two things happen when, when God shows up and his fear enters us. There's two things that happens to somebody's heart. Either it brings that person to a heart of repentance or brings that person to a place of rejection. Think about it. When God really shows up and does something miraculous, it either brings somebody saying, God, I, I need you. Forgive me for what I've done. Or it brings the person to a place saying, I know that's not real. That's fake. And trying to discredit it and trying to disassociate from it. Our culture does it all the time. So when the townspeople get there, rather than rejoicing in it, they have a different response. So the townspeople, they arrive, they come, and you, know, you would think they've seen the power of Jesus in this man's life. And, and I think you would think that they're like, if he can do this in this man's life, I'm not that bad. So maybe, what can he do in me? Like, I have, I have some hurts, I have some pains. But that, at this point, that's not what they do. Instead of um, asking Jesus to work in their lives, they ask him to leave. They are afraid, and they are not ready, yet ready, for the interruption of Jesus in their lives. Jesus, in some ways, has come and, and interrupted some of their way of life. Maybe those pigs belong to some of them, and now their way of life is in the Sea of Galilee. And so there is life has been interrupted, possibly economically for some of them, in, in whatever way. And that is true even sometimes in our own lives, as in our Christian walk, but we also know those that are not living for Jesus, that Jesus wants to interrupt their lives. He wants to come in and bring change and hope and freedom. But even in our Christian walk, sometimes Jesus wants to, to interrupt us. We, you know, we kind of have a plan in mind. We know what we're doing. We think we, we've got it together. And maybe even as we're following Jesus, but sometimes Jesus wants to interrupt and say, hey, I actually want you to go this way instead. And sometimes we may not be quite ready for that interruption. We're like, Jesus, I know what, I'm following you, but I know what I'm doing. <laughs> but Jesus wants to work and move, and he wants to sometimes interrupt us as well as those who are not living. He wants to interrupt them for sure and bring them along his path. And he wants to restore them to himself, just like he did in this man's life. He wants to restore those who are away from him. And I believe that even this man, you know, it was obvious to everyone that he was far from Lord. You know, he was demon-possessed. He was obviously, he needed a touch from Jesus. But we, and we know people that are in those situations today that are, they're obviously far from Jesus. But we also know those people that, they look like they got it together. Pretty comfortable. I can do this on my own. And they look like, you know, maybe they aren't serving Jesus, but they think that that's okay because that's just for the weak people anyways. And I, I'm strong. I can do it without Jesus. But I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus Christ wants to bring those that seem that they're in the most desperate of situations or those that seem like they're in the most comfortable situations and everyone in between. He wants to bring each and every one to restoration. Jesus Christ loves each one in this world around us. We all know people that are in the different situations that are not serving Jesus, but he wants to restore them to himself because Jesus loves them. He has a plan for their life. There is hope and freedom in him alone. We all know and we've all experienced that life is not always good. You know, we live in a fallen world and we all experience hardship and times that are difficult, but we serve a God who is always good. He is always faithful, and he is with us. And we, because of what he has done in us, we have something to share. Like you're sharing just, you know, you, we have something to share with those who do not know him, that are not living for him, that have chosen to reject him, that have chosen to say, I'm not ready for that. The Holy Spirit wants to work and move in those hearts and lives as we do what he's called us to do. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he's called you to minister. Does that mean you're going to get up here and preach? Maybe, maybe not. But it does mean you're, he's called you to share your story, to share what he's done in your life and how he's working in you. When Jesus is the most important thing in our life, it should be a natural thing for us to, to share about who he is in our lives and what he's doing in our lives. I said, talk about how, you know, what, so a big part of my life is my children, right? I have three kids, and I, I'm going to talk about them because they're just such a big part of my life. But Jesus Christ is such a big part of my life that I want it to be a natural thing, that I'm talking about who he is in my life. And what he's doing in my life, because we are blessed, and I can walk. It. I walked in here today with the the power of the Holy Spirit in me, and because of His power and Spirit in us, we have the opportunity to share 
who he is and what he's doing in our lives. So regardless of where Jesus calls you, if he calls you to be in this area where you're living for the rest of your life, or if he calls you to go elsewhere, God wants to use you. Wherever he calls you, wherever you're at, he wants you. Whatever season of life you're in, I believe that God, you're still here, God still has a plan. He still has a purpose, and he still wants to minister not only to you, but through you, and use our lives for his glory and his kingdom. And that's such an amazing opportunity that he gives us that privilege to be used by him. He could do it another way, but he chooses to use us as his people. And I'm so thankful that we, you know, I'm thankful that we get to do what God's called us to do, but I'm thankful that God also has a plan and a purpose for you where he's called you and he wants to continue to work and move in you and through you. Amen. Amen. God wants to use this where we're at. And God wants to use this man as well. The end of the story, this man runs over towards Jesus. The town people tell Jesus to leave. Jesus listens and says, okay. The man runs over towards Jesus and says, Jesus, take me with you. Why would he not want to go with Jesus? Jesus just healed him, restored him, loved on him, brought him back to community, clothed him. Why would he not want to continue this journey with Jesus? But Jesus tells him, no, you can't come with me. You guys know that sometimes our no's from God's, God leads to a greater blessing from him. He may tell you no for a season because he has something greater in store for your life. So he tells this man, no, you cannot come with me. But instead, this is what I want you to do. He commissions him. He said, I want you to go home. Go home. Go home to your friends. Go home to your family. Go home and just share your story. Share what God has done in you. How much mercy and grace God has shown to you. Go home and just share what God's done with you. And so this man went home. What I love about it is he went home to a people. He went home to the community that just rejected Jesus. Now the people that said, Jesus, please leave us alone. Get away from us. Who's was going to have somebody walking in their community was as a walking billboard of what Jesus can do in one's life. Wherever he went, people would have known him. No longer as the man who lives among the tomb, but he would have known him as the man who had an encounter with the man named Jesus. And he, his, and he went home, the scripture said. And he went home and he probably shared his story with his family and friends. He probably shared his story with the community that was around him. Then he went to the ten cities in his region and shared everyone who would, end up, everyone who would listen to those ten cities what God had done in his life. How much mercy and grace God has shown to him. What I love about it is later on, if you look through, if you read through commentary, some commentary, some, some scholars believe that later on when Jesus returned to that region, the multitudes of people ran towards Jesus because they heard what Jesus could do. Because this man went and shared the story. Church, I believe there's power to our story. I love it this morning. When we preached, we heard a story of testimony of how much God is working in people's lives. There is power to your story. Power to it. Not because of you, even though you're wonderful people. There's power to your story because you invited Jesus into your story. You said, Jesus, come along. I want to learn. I want to walk along with you and discover what you can do in me and through me. God has a purpose and plan for your life, like Ashley said. God has a purpose and plan for you today. He wants to use you to do great things to restore the kingdom of God. What I love about it, if you continue reading through Scripture, usually continue reading through Scripture. We, we finish, you get into the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls upon the church. The church grows by 3,000, 1,000 that day. Later on, the church, as the church is growing by 3,000, the church continues to grow daily because the Holy Spirit is moving upon the primitive church. Peter and John are walking in an hour of prayer. They see a man who's crippled by the side of the road, and they heal this man. And the Sadducees and the various religious leaders call them out. They say, come and have a council together, yell at them. Basically say, stop sharing this word. Or else. Peter and John leave that room of hearing the or else and goes and have a meeting with the people of the church that were there in Jerusalem. And, and they share what just happened and what just unfolded. And then they go into prayer. And what do they pray for? They say, God, give us. They have the Holy Spirit right in them. But they pray for boldness. They pray for boldness. They say, God, give us boldness. And at the conclusion, when, they, when their prayer was coming to an end, the place that they were at started shaking, and they received boldness to go out to the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why did they receive boldness? Because I believe Jesus, God knew persecution was going to rise against the church, and the church was going to spread throughout the land. But they needed boldness to deal with the things that they're going to be facing in front of them, the trials and tribulations, the struggles and difficulties that they were going to face because of society around them. Church, I think it's time for us to once again remind ourselves we need boldness. We need boldness to go out our doors to proclaim his message, to proclaim his word, to proclaim his story that's unfolding in our life. We need boldness. Amen. And God wants to give you not just his spirit dwells in you already if you receive him as your Lord and Savior, 
We just need to remind ourselves daily to pray for boldness, to go out and share our message. His message that's working unfolding through us. If I can challenge you with any as we conclude today is this. Go home. Don't call me out here. What are we doing? Go home. Go home to your neighbors. Go home to your friends. Go home to your grandkids. Go home to your husband or wife if they're not sitting with you today. Go home to your co-workers. Go home to the gasoline clerk you may see on a daily basis. Or if you're a routine eater at McDonald's, go to that clerk you see at McDonald's. Go to the places you go to normally and share your story. Share what God has done in you, how much God has blessed you, watched over you, protected you, and loved on you. Share your story. Don't hold it to yourself. If you're an older person and you have grandkids, don't hold that story back. Share the story of your encounter with Jesus and how Jesus transformed you and changed you. Don't hold it back, but continuously go home and share your story. As we conclude today, I just want to pray for you as a church. That we may do that. That we may go home. That we may have boldness. That we may share what God is doing in us. That's what we do in today. Each day we walk out and we say, God, we just share our story. I will sit with men and have dinner and have coffee with men and let them talk about their lives and then I'll talk about my life, but I'll have to incorporate Jesus into my story. And as I shared them, we shared how Jesus is not just a religious institution, but Jesus is a personal relationship they can have. It reintroduces them to who Christ can be in their lives. Go home and share your story today. So let's pray. Father God, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for this church, God, and we thank you for all that you do within us, Lord. God, I pray that today, Father, that you may continue to bless this congregation, Father. That you may continue to bless this church, Father. That you continue to bless each person who calls this place home, Father. That you may move within them, God. If they're in the building or watching through Facebook, may you bless them, Father. And may you draw them closer to you, God. Lord, I pray that each morning that we may wake up and say, Lord, give me boldness, God. And that we may walk out our doors with boldness, knowing that we're not all by ourselves on this journey. But we have a God who loves us and who's working in us and who's by us and who's near us and who's always with us, no matter what we face. God, I pray that you bless us this morning. Give us boldness, God. This week I pray for divine appointments for each person, God. Opportunities for them to speak life, hope, and encouragement to their neighbors, to their friends, and to the people around them, God. Father, when we never be settled where we're at, but when we continue to be shaken up in order to be wakened up to the gracious, gracious things you can do through us, Father. Just this church, God. May you become a beacon of hope within this city, God. That everyone from the surrounding regions may know this is a God-fearing, Christ-centered place that loves Jesus and is doing the miraculous things for the kingdom of God. Continue to bless the leadership here. Bless the direction that they're taking, Father. And just have your hand upon this house. Father, we just pray for blessings and favor wherever they go. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this time. Amen, amen. I want to thank you, Pastor Rob, for the opportunity to come and share. I want to hand it back over. Thank you. And we're, would you stand with me this morning? Uh, one of the things as we pray for Ashley and Jose is that we always say, hey, God, you just put people in our lives that we can be partners with. And that we just can raise them up. And, and we know that God is, uh, has put them, that we cross paths for a reason. Amen? And then uh, I don't know if you noticed, but it, it seems like a theme of interruptions today. Uh, because God wants to interrupt our lives and get our attention. And he says, I want you to trust me and, and follow it, and follow what I have for you. And then he said, I've got a lot of interruptions for you today. He said, there's no, there's no person that's not it. We say, oh, that's an interruption. No, that's who God's put in your life. Are we listening? Are we, are, we, are we waiting for that? Say, God, what do you have for us today? Would you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you again for this day and this time. Lord, that you interrupted our lives and that we listen. Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to just have our eyes on you. We pray that you would help us to have our hearts set on you, Lord, that you would just direct our paths, that you would just, Lord, you would just let your spirit lead us that we would just listen. Lord, we pray for Ashley and Jose. Lord, we thank you for their lives. Lord, we thank you for their children. Lord, we pray right now your blessing upon them, Lord. No, not just that, that they have fun, Lord, but that you would use them 
that you would use them in lives where real people that need to hear, Lord, and we just pray that you would just use this family. We pray for their provision, Lord, that you would just help them in everything they need. Lord, you said you would supply all we need, and we just trust you in that. And Father, we pray that you would help us to listen as you interrupt our lives and as you bring interruptions into our lives. And Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, we would have your heart. And we ask it in your name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Don't forget, uh, they have a table at the back. If you want to catch that and see, there's some uh, cards there. And if you wanted to sign up for reminders, that that's back at the back as well. Hola, amigo. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.